Hello, BookTube. Mark at Book Time with Elvis and I are reading you a book. <laughs> we are reading you The Warden by Anthony Trollope here in my beautiful uh, Penguin Classic edition. We are swapping off chapter by chapter, and we are rapidly approaching the end. This is not a long Trollope novel. Uh, and I am going to read you today chapter 18, which is titled The Warden is Very Obstinate. Uh, and I'm going to try, as usual, to keep Steve interpolations to a minimum, <laughs> so that when this is inevitably compiled into a watch list, it won't be half lectures <laughs> from, from an admittedly sexy old coot in Boston. Uh, so we will just pr proceed with Chapter 18. A little bit of preface material just to catch you up to the story. Uh, the Archdeacon has gone to London to ask about his case with Sir Abraham Haphazard, the Attorney General. Uh, he's gone without telling his son-in-law uh, because he doesn't want Archdeacon Grantley to be angry or to stop him from doing it. Uh, because he knows that Archdeacon Dan Grantley would disagree with him. Uh, Archdeacon Grantley is married to one of his daughters. And the other one of his daughters, Eleanor, is in love with John Bold, who is the reformer who has started all the trouble that has made the warden go to London. <laughs> but that is it. That ought to do. Uh, so this is chapter 18. The warden is very obstinate. Dr. Grantley is here, sir, greeted his ears before the door was well open. And Mrs. Grantley, they have a sitting room above and are waiting up for you. Uh, the warden has gone to see Abraham Haphazard at 10 at night. The interview has lasted an hour. It's taken him an hour to get back home. So it's late. Uh, there was something in the tone of the man's voice which seemed to indicate that even he looked upon the warden as a runaway schoolboy just recaptured by his guardian and that he pitied the culprit, though he could not but be horrified at the crime. The warden endeavored to appear unconcerned, as he said, Oh, indeed, I'll go upstairs at once. But he failed signally. <laughs> there was perhaps a ray of comfort in the presence of his married daughter, that is to say, of comparative comfort, seeing that his son-in-law was there. But how much would, uh, would he have preferred that they should both have been safe at Plumstead Episcopi, instead of making the trip to London? Uh, however, upstairs he went, and the waiter slowly preceding him, and on the door being opened, the archdeacon was discovered standing in the middle of the room, erect indeed as usual, but oh, how sorrowful. <laughs> and on a dingy sofa behind him reclined his patient wife. Papa, I thought you were never coming back, said the lady. It's twelve o'clock. Yes, my dear, said the warden. The attorney general named ten for my meeting, and, and to be sure, ten is late, but what could I do, you know? Great men will have their own way. And he gave his daughter a kiss, and shook hands with the doctor, and again tried to look unconcerned. And have you absolutely been with the Attorney General? asked the Archdeacon. Mr. Hardy signified that he had. Good heavens, how unfortunate. And the Archdeacon raised his huge hands in the manner of which his friends are so accustomed to see him express disapprobation and astonishment. What will Sir Abraham think of it? Did you not know that it is not customary for clients to go direct to their counsel? Isn't it? Asked the, asked the warden, innocently. Well, at any rate, I've done it now. Sir Abraham didn't seem to think it was very strange. The archdeacon gave a sigh that would have moved a man of war. <laughs> but, Papa, what did you say to Sir Abraham? Asked the lady. I asked him, my dear, to explain John Harem's will to me. He couldn't explain it in the only... He couldn't explain it in the only way which would have satisfied me, and so I resigned the wardenship. Resigned it, said the archdeacon, in a solemn voice, sad and low, yet very sufficiently audible, a sort of whisper that MacReady would have envied and the galleries would have applauded with a couple of rounds, a famous period actor. Uh, resigned it, good heavens, and the dignitary of the church sank back horrified into a horsehair armchair. At least I told Sir Abraham that I would resign, and I, of course, must now do so. Not at all, said the archdeacon, catching a ray of hope. Nothing that you say in such a way to your own counsel can be in any way binding on you. Of course you were there to ask his advice. I'm sure Sir Abraham did not advise you to any such step. Mr. Harding could not say that he had. And I'm sure that he, adv that he disadvised you from it, continued the Reverend Cross-Examiner. Mr. Harding could not deny this. I'm sure Sir Abraham must have advised you to consult your friends. To this proposition also, Mr. Harding was obliged to assent. Then your threat of resignation amounts to nothing, and we are just as we were before. Mr. Harding was now standing on the rug, moving uneasily from one foot to another. He made no distinct answer to the archdeacon's last proposition, for his mind was chiefly engaged on thinking how he could escape to bed. 
that his resignation was a thing finally fixed on, a fact all but completed, was not in his mind a matter of any doubt. He knew his own weakness. He knew how prone he was to be led. But he was not weak enough to give way now, to go back to that position from to which his conscience had driven him, after having purposely come to London to declare his determination. He did not in the least doubt his resolution, but he greatly doubted his power of defending it against his son-in-law. "'You must be very tired, Susan,' he said. "'Wouldn't you like to go to bed?' But Susan didn't want to go till her husband went. She had the, an idea that her papa might be bullied if she were away. She wasn't tired at all, or at least she said so. The archdeacon was pacing the room, expressing by certain noddles of his head his opinion of the utter fatuity of his father-in-law. "'Why, at last,' he said, and angels might have blushed at the rebuke expressed in his tone and emphasis. Why did you go off from Barchester so suddenly? Why did you take such a step without giving us notice after what had passed at the palace? The warden hung his head and made no reply. He could not condescend to say that he had not intended to give his son-in-law the slip, and as he had not the courage to avow it, he said nothing. Papa has been too much for you, said the lady. The archdeacon took another turn, then ejaculated, Good heavens, this time in a low whisper, but still audible. At any rate, you'll promise me to take no further step without consultation, said the archdeacon. Mr. Harding made no answer, but slowly proceeded to light his candle. Of course, continued the other, such a declaration as you made to Sir Abraham means nothing. Come, warden, promise me this. The whole affair, you see, is already settled, and that with little trouble or expense. Bold has been compelled to abandon his action and all you have to do is remain quiet at the hospital. Mr. Harding still made no reply, but looked meekly into his son-in-law's face. The archdeacon thought he knew his father-in-law, but he was mistaken. He thought he had already taken over a vacillating man to resign his promise. Come, said he, promise Susan to give up this idea of resigning the wardenship. The warden looked at his daughter, thinking probably at that moment if El that if Eleanor were con contented with him, he need not so much regard his other child and said, I am sure Susan will not ask me to break my word or to do what I know to be wrong. Papa, said she, it would be madness in you to throw up your preferment. What are you to live on? He makes 800 a year, keep in mind, a large amount of money. Uh, God, that feeds, this young, that feeds the young ravens will take care of me also, said Mr. Harding, with a smile, as though afraid of giving offense by making his reference to scripture too solemn. Pish, said the archdeacon, turning away rapidly. If the ravens persisted in refusing the food prepared for them, they wouldn't be fed. A clergyman generally dislikes to be met in argument by any scriptural quotation. <laughs> he feels an affront, as affronted as a doctor does when recommended by an old woman to take some favorite dose, <laughs> or as a lawyer when a, an unprofessional man attempts to put him down by a quibble. I shall have the living of Crabtree, modestly suggested the warden. Eighty pounds a year, sneered the archdeacon, and the precentorship said his father-in-law. It goes with the wardenship, said the son-in-law. Mr. Harding was prepared to argue this point and began to do so, but Dr. Grantly stopped him. My dear warden, said he, this is all nonsense. Eighty pounds or a hundred or sixty makes very little difference. You can't live on it. You can't ruin Eleanor's prospects forever. In point of fact, you can't resign. The bishop wouldn't accept it. The whole thing is settled. What I now want to do is prevent any inconvenient tittle-tattle, any more newspaper articles. That's what I want, too, said the warden. And to prevent that, continued the other, we mustn't let any talk of resignation get abroad. But I shall resign, said the warden, very, very meekly. Good heavens, Susan, my dear, what can I say to him? But Papa, said Mrs. Grantly, getting up and putting her arm through that of her father, what, if, if, what is Eleanor to do if you throw away your income? A hot tear stood in each of the warden's eyes as he looked round at, upon his married daughter. Why should one sister who was so rich predict poverty for another? <laughs> Mrs. Grantley could easily make Eleanor a very handsome allowance. She need not, she need not be dispossessed by this. It never crosses her mind. Uh, such an idea was on, the mi was on his mind, but he gave no utterance to it. Then he thought of the pelican feeding its young with blood from its own breast, but he gave no utterance to that either. And then of Eleanor waiting at, for him at home, waiting to congratulate him on the end of all his trouble. Eleanor is in favor of him resigning. If it bothers him so much, all she cares about is his mental well-being, unlike his other daughter. Think of Eleanor, Papa, said Mrs. Grantly. I do think of her, said her father. And you will not do this rash thing. The lady was really moved beyond her usual calm composure. 
<laughs> it can never be rash to do right, said he. I shall certainly resign this wardenship. Then, Mr. Harding, there is nothing before you but ruin, said the archdeacon, now moved beyond all endurance. Ruin for both you and Eleanor. How do you mean to pay the monstrous expenses of this action? Mrs. Grantley suggested that, as the action was abandoned, the cost would not be heavy. Indeed, they will be, my dear, continued he. One cannot have the Attorney General up at twelve o'clock at night for nothing. But, of course, your father has not thought of this. I will sell my furniture, said the warden. <laughs> furniture? ejaculated the other with a most powerful sneer. Oh, come, come, Archdeacon, said the lady. We needn't mind that at present. You know you never expected Papa to pay the cost. Such absurdity is enough to provoke Job, <laughs> said the Archdeacon, marching quickly up and down the room. Your father is like a child. Eight hundred pounds a year, eight hundred and eighty with the house, and nothing to do. The very place for him. And to throw that up because some scoundrel writes an article in a newspaper? Well, I have done my duty. If he chooses to ruin his child, I cannot help it. And he stood still at the fireplace and looked at himself in a dingy mirror which stood on the chimney piece. There was a pause for about a minute, and then the warden, finding that nothing else was coming, lighted his candle and quietly said good night. Good night, Papa, said the lady. And so the warden retired, but as he closed the door behind him, he heard the well-known ejaculation, slower, lower, more solemn, more ponderous than ever. Good heavens! And that is chapter 18. Very short, but I'm not complaining, <laughs> because it was a real chapter. And not the make-weight filler that I've been reading the last few times. I think, I think it's pretty safe to say that both Mark and I have nothing but winner chapters from here on out. There is, as I've commented many, many times, there is nothing like Trollope when he is in the final stretch of the race. <laughs> when he sees the end in sight, there's nothing quite like him. Uh, and, uh, well, that end is inside. <laughs> we are close to the end of this book. So that was chapter 18, where the warden confirms his decision to resign. 800 a year for doing absolutely nothing. All because of articles in the newspaper have troubled his conscience. And uh, we will see what Mark reads in the next chapter. But keep in mind, we're almost at the end of the warden. It won't be, it won't see us out the week. Uh, which, and that leaves all of September. Now, Mark and I have a read-along plan for October, a read-to-you, a read-aloud plan for October, but that leaves all of September. And if we don't occupy him, Mark is bound to fall into trouble. <laughs> so, so if there's a, a word that you would like to, to hear, feel free to sing out in the comments section. I have quite a few candidates of my own that I think that will work fine for the last three weeks of September. There are plenty of shorter works that are in the common domain. Uh, but, that is chapter 18. You'll move on to chapter 19 on Mark's channel, uh, and then I'll be back for chapter 20. Thank you, book two.